All right, guys, this is this is a we want to do a short a short we want to have a, a short conversation about fear, and I think that okay we have all experienced it in one way or the other. My my philosopher yeah. was trying to push the topic away to the psychologist yesterday. <laughs> and this is for the psychologist to deal with, but no, 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 he he couldn't run away. So <laughs> thanks for joining us, Kevin. And then also, uh, we have Kobina here, we have Kombian here. Uh, we are discussing fear, and this is this is a casual conversation, and maybe we may share with the world afterwards, or we we'll keep it to ourselves. But whatever happens, we want to <laughs> we want to explore the subject of fear. So just just to get into it and wade in the waters a bit, um, the first question would be whether fear is even real or it's just an illusion. Because sometimes some people say, oh, fear is just in your mind. I know our motivational speakers who <laughs> will say something like, fear is in your mind, you can overcome it, just just forget about it. But is there something that you can just dismiss or it is there that you have to confront? Like, let's just begin from that angle. Is, is fear real or is just an illusion? You start with prof. Well, I'll say with one is for prof. Okay. <laughs> ah, so let's probably go so that I, I can, can, I can prof, learn and uh, contribute. We have Kambia, we have uh, uh, Rudolf, <laughs> and then we have Kambia. So I don't see who is, is there. Hey, a, Professor Kambia. <laughs> Professor Kambia, yes, Kambia. That's, 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 we, we want to use. Yes, make, it, use make it simple. Um, it's there's not a, I mean let's have a casual conversation. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you know, when you ask a philosopher a question what is real, you you there are two reactions. Hmm. Either he attempts to confront it or he tries to walk away. And when he tries to walk away, he does so in order to stand at a place where he can see the thing well. So when you ask whether fear is real, hmm, I'm tempted to run away. <laughs> but uh, my initial uh, uh, impression is that if I'm not going to give a straightforward definition, I'm going to give an analysis so that we try from that analysis to see if we can impose on it a definition. So my analysis is this. There is a condition and I stand in some significant relation to that condition. And whether my state, my inner resources, and everything that I have in approaching the condition is adequate or not, determines the extent to which I have fear about that condition. So we're looking at a situation where, for example, I am. The condition here is an examination. I stand in a significant relation with that examination because I have to take it. I have to write it. It's mine and some other people's examination to take. What, how prepared am I for the examination? So they refer to the inner resources that I can rely on to write the examination. Sometimes they can be external resources too. Like when your professor allows you to use textbooks or some other means to write the exam. So first there's a situation, your preparedness to face the situation, the result is fear or no fear. So in some instance, if you look at this analysis that appears, there's, there's nothing per se that we can call fear. It is a result of some form of unpreparedness that's, that's, that's the first way to look at it. Okay. Another way uh, to understand it is to look at it as one of many emotions mm -hmm. which are triggered in us by different factors. So just as the sight of um, something beautiful triggers admiration in you, the sight of something terrific or terrible or threatening invokes fear in you. So it's an internal psychological state which can be uh, triggered by different kinds of factors. So what may trigger fear in uh, Rudolph may not trigger fear in uh, Kovna. What may trigger fear in Kombia may not even trigger fear in, uh, 
in uh, in uh, Rudolph. So it, it's that's another way to look at it. Mm. But whether we we try to that uh, when we say it's real, we can't obviously talk at, uh, talk about it as though it's uh, some physical thing that we can place our finger on. But well, it's not only the physical that is real. I'm sure some of you are. Uh, some people may contest this, but uh, well, we have uh, all kinds of reality that is that has no extension, uh, does not occupy space, mm -hmm. uh, does not have any of the properties that we often uh, impose on, on material stuff. So, uh, so I mean, uh, the philosophy of mind that's a gang we call them fiscalists. Uh, they, they, they tend to reduce the mind to a physical substance, and that what we call brain functioning. So what we call the mind is nothing other than the functional brain. So uh, in that sense, uh, they equate uh, something like um, pain. They equate it with uh, the firing of C fiber. Now, if 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 you are to look at that, for them, we can trace pain to the firing of C fiber. So we can also trace fear to some region of our brain. Uh, anytime fear is, uh, we, we are afraid of something, psychologists can measure and know exactly which part of our brain is triggered. So if you want to be uh, extremely fiscalist about fear, then you can say, well, even if it is not something physical we can touch, there is a sense in which we can trace its physical origin, yeah. maybe in some region of the brain or something like that. So, but uh, uh, all of this is just to more like clear the ground and introduce properly the topic of fear, uh, whether we understand it as uh, a result of our unpreparedness to face a given situation or something that is triggered by some threatening condition outside of us, sometimes inside of us. Or we want to look at it in terms of uh, its origin in some physical region of our brain. Uh, fear is something we experience every day. It's real. It's real. Uh, if I did my first time uh, traveling to the UK to do a master's, it was funny. I was going and I had not, I mean, I had not left Ghana before. Well, I, I've crossed the border to Ivory Coast, to Burkina Faso, to uh, Togo and those places. But technically, that is not to travel outside that. Yeah. So when I was when I was going, I was like, okay, what am I looking forward to? I, I mean, the mixed feelings of not knowing exactly what to expect and what not to expect kind of makes you a bit nervous. Maybe you can interpret that kind of nervousness or you can relate it with fear to some extent. So fear comes in different forms. You, uh, you are walking in the dark, you hear some unfamiliar sound or noise. The, that uncertainty about exactly what it is, your inability to determine the nature of the thing that is making noise, creates in you a certain anxiety which results in fear. So fear is something we experience, it's normal. There's absolutely no human being on earth who does not fear something. Absolutely, absolutely. We don't have so, fearless people on earth. We use the, I mean, fearless is used indexically uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in language. That's, uh, when we talk of indexicality, it sounds like a big term, but it simply says it relies on its context for its meaning. So if I say today is a beautiful day, today refers to this day. Mm -hmm. then tomorrow when I say today is a beautiful day I'm no longer referring to this day I'm referring to tomorrow okay. so it relies on the context for its meaning so mm -hmm. uh, fear when we say somebody is fearless it's an indexical usage of the word to, to say that relative to something or some situation he is fearless or yeah. the person is entirely uh, uh I'm sure you know of the Finihas Gate, uh, a guy who suffered some accident, as I think I don't know what pierced his mind, his right. brain, sorry. Brain, yes. And uh, yeah. it affected the region where he feels empathy. 
Now, if somebody suffers something like that and is unable to feel fear, we know that is a pathological situation. It, it's as a result of uh, uh, some part of this physical human being not functioning properly, that's why. But when we take the normal, fully functional human being, you fear something. No matter how small the fear is, right. there's absolutely no human being who is who is mm -hmm. entirely devoid of fear. All right. So it means that in in just to look at this from uh, one angle, uh, feeling fear is actually uh, part of uh, part of humanity. So when someone it's doesn't feel fear, it's it's rather than uh, abnormal and to to find that there's a person who doesn't feel fear. I'm going to read a second yeah. stanza of Bernard's poem. From, from which uh, this whole conversation started. <laughs> if you yes. want to start. It said something like, terrifying sounds echoing deep, lonely nights growing dark against my lantern mismatch. Yet not enough to break me because I walk with the extinguisher of fear. So I would circle back to the first thing you said concerning um, the scenario where maybe a person is unprepared for exam and therefore is afraid of what the results may be, I would, I would come back to that. But based on, based on that, he also shared that fear could be um, just, just as we are humans. We encounter situations where, because we don't know the outcome, there is some uncertainty about what might happen. And so we, we are just afraid and it's normal. We've established that it's very normal to feel such. But I was thinking about this particular word Kobuna used for, for his poem. And so yeah. the word, the, the, the sentence, against my lantern mismatch, it means that he's coming up against something that what he carries is not enough to meet that particular situation or problem. And so he's afraid of what might happen. But then Good. he's not afraid because he is working with the extinguisher of fear. There, this, this is this is an external entity in code, or um, let's say um, an external something that is going to help him match what he's facing. And you mentioned that it could be something could be internal or external. Whether the fear is coming from inside or outside. So let's explore that a little bit, Kobna. Let's let's talk about that. What would, what would, I know a poem conveys a lot, and usually the stanzas don't do justice to what the poet want to say. So we want to give you the opportunity. Like, tell us what what were you trying to convey with that particular stanza? Before Kavna even comes in, I mean, uh, can we just at least recognize the the the, the beautiful poet that he is? Right. That's, that <laughs> phrase. It's a beautiful metaphor. The extinguisher of fear. Of fear. It's a beautiful metaphor. And it's loaded with meaning. You, yeah. you can have a million and one interpretation of that I extinguisher <laughs> of fear. I, it's, I mean, it, a lot of people who are able to play with words at that level, that's a beautiful metaphor. So yeah. uh, just to recognize him before uh, he goes on so, to tell us we, what exactly is intended to we salute, we salute the literal brilliance we are, we, are, we are enjoying here. That particular stanza stood out for me. And, <laughs> When I was reading it, actually it came from a book that he wrote, uh, A Pleasant Aroma, which is a collection of poems. It's, it's a very good book. We will talk about it at the end. So, Kobna, let's hear you. Well, thank you. I'm honored to be in the midst of a professor and a growing mind that I find very um, intriguing, intriguing for Rudolf. Um, I just want to touch a little bit on what Prof said before talking about the poem. I totally agree with Paul when he says that um, sometimes it's a situation that you're not prepared for. Fear can be that situation you're not prepared for. And when you find yourself in that situation, you feel fear because you know that, and you feel afraid because you know you're not prepared for it. And yes, of course, also with the emotion part. I strongly believe that we are never without fear. We are never without fear. There is no point in our life where we are, we are, we are saying that we are completely devoid of fear, that we are fearless. At every point in our life, and the fear comes in different, flies in different forms on different levels. Because if you are not in an academic setting, you're going to experience a different fear that somebody in an academic setting will not experience. Take, for example, even in a relationship, you, you find a girl that you're interested in. There's this fear as to whether to go, will, will she say yes? 
So we are never without fear in every area of our lives as we grow up. We have to, we, we have to confront fear in order to move to the next level or in order to experience what is ahead of us. So we are never without fear. So I don't also believe that there are people that say that, well, people do not realize that if they have grown to a certain level in their life, they have already overcome a certain level of fear. They don't realize that. And if they know that, they can tap into that to fight or to confront the fear that is ahead of them. They don't realize it. If you have been in class, I mean, if you have stayed, been in the academic setting before, you have experience. Irrespective of how brilliant you are as a student, there is a paper that before, even if you have learned, when you sit behind the paper, you experience that fear. So you are never without it. And we have had experience in overcoming it. And I believe that as we grow, maybe the fear that we encounter, if I should say, if I'm quantified and I'm going to maybe quantify it in volumes, then I'll say that the volume of fear that we experience as we grow begins to increase. Because if I've passed my basic examination, if you put a question that is in that line for me, there's no way I'm going to be scared. I mean, if you're your kid sister or your child bring you uh, an elementary mathematics, you just look at it and you laugh because men are fast. This is not the fear that I'm confronted with now. So that aside. Now, this poem is purely from uh, a, a religious point of view. So purely from that side, not necessarily philosophical, <laughs> but purely from a religious point of view because I believe that where my limitation ends, as well God's um, maybe providence or God's ability begins. So, and I know that, well, I also believe that the world is not just a physical place. There's a physical, there's a physical realm, there's a spiritual realm. And I believe that really before something happened in the physical realm, it takes place in the spiritual realm. And if you have somebody who has the ability, who is fearless, who has the ability to work on everything, then it's just with you align with the person and say, look, I may not be able to confront this particular challenge, but I know somebody who can't and I'm siding with the person. So once I'm with the person, I am okay. So that poem, terrifying sound echoing deep, all of us, no matter your level of um, education, your level of experience, there's going to be a sound or you find yourself in a place that that sound is going to scare you. If you're walking alone in, <laughs> in the dark at night, you're going to hear something that will scare you. I remember one time in Kenya, I went to visit a friend and the person's hostel is located away from the away from the main street. You actually have to negotiate a bush and then meet the person before you come, before you see the person's house, actually. And then when I got there, he said that, oh, let me see you. I can find my way back. It's not a problem. So immediately I left him and I started my journey back. The lights went off. The whole place was dark. And whilst I was, whilst I was walking, I saw this person or creature, whatever you want, what name you want to give to it. I mean, the, the guy was huge. And the way he was walking, he put fear in me. So what I did was to remove my shirt and tie it to my left knee and started jumping and walking and shouting. But I realized the one that I thought I was afraid of was now afraid of me and the person ran. <laughs> and then I had to, <laughs> I had to run to my hostel, you know, I got I got to the main room. I didn't stop running. I got to my room. Before my roommate said, how are you dressed? What is wrong with you? Before I came to my senses, I realized that I'm actually, I'm naturally topless and my, I have tied my shirt to my knee. So I believe that irrespective of how old you are, your experience, you are going to experience, and you are going to, there is some sound that is going to put fear in you. And when you are lonely, okay, you are lonely and walking in the, in the place that, that is dark. All of us, I believe, have um, a certain amount of light in us. We, all of us, all of us are light in a way. And I believe that just going off, I believe that we can even bright the corner that we are with our light. But sometimes our light is not enough to, to extinguish the darkness that we are confronted with, with the world, or even in a small community. So the fear that I experience against my, my lantern, which is small, is mismatch. It's not enough. But it's not enough to break me. The sound that I hear is not enough to break me. The darkness where I walk is not enough to break me. Do my lantern is small, it's not enough to break me because I am walking with the extinguisher of fear, the one who hears nothing. 
the one that I said in our scripture. I mean, for a Christian, I'm told that fear not appears like 360 something times in the Bible. I think God knows that we need one every day. Do you mind putting a face on that? Maybe you have an, an idea who thinks I mean the figure yeah, that, you're referring that, to as that thing. extinguisher of fear. Can we can we get a description or some form of presentation? Like who is the extinguisher of fear? Because it, it, this is someone that if there's somebody who extinguishes fear, I'm sure anyone who is afraid would want to have that in his in his corner. <laughs> so so that we could we could have a like what is that? Is it is it a drug? Is it is it is it some form of a <laughs> talisman that we need to put around our waist? Or what is that extinguisher of fear? Okay, so I'm going to say that this extinguisher of fear is actually twofold. It's an understanding of of God's presence with you. It's an understanding of that. So you know that God is with you. But in reality, the extinguisher of fear is God. But once you have that understanding, it's enough to carry you through that journey that you are on. So, so it's not because there are some people that know that there is God, but they don't have that understanding. They don't even believe that he is the extinguisher of fear. But to have that understanding is enough for me to walk through that, that tunnel. It's enough for me to actually sing through that echoing and uh, terrifying sound. This is from I, the I, I, religious let me, point of view. Let me put chip in this. Is <laughs> what the okay. psalmist says in 23, verse, um, um, let's say, I think I was just reading it. Um, verse 4, Psalm 23, 4. It says that, Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And then and, and it gets to the end. So is it what you are referring to that? Even though you are going through a fearful situation, you have this uh, mindset that there's somebody with you who can carry you through. Is that that mindset? Yes, that is it. And you see, the beauty of it is that the beauty of it is that fear does not go away. Mm. That's the beauty of it. It's not as if that once you know that you're working with the extinguisher of fear, fear is going to, is going is, is going to go away. It doesn't, which leaves you with some form of responsibility yourself. Because the person is there, but are you actually going to work with him? Are you going to trust that he will carry you through from one point to the other? So that's also a huge responsibility we have to look at. So it's not enough to say that, okay, I know that he's there. But do you trust him that though he's there, you are going to walk the journey with him knowing that he's there? Because there are some people that will say that, okay, I don't want to do it again. You do it for me. But God does not give up that. that. He gives us the responsibility. You are going to do it like he just read. Yet do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? He didn't say that God gave me light so that there is no valley of shadow of death. It's still there. But I know that he's with me. So I walk through it. It's the same understanding I address or I confront all the fear that um, I meet in my daily life. I know that God is with me. And I know he's not going to take that, that away, that situation or that fear away. But him being with me, understanding and having that consciousness is enough to give me strength to walk through it. So I have a question. It leads me to a question for Combian. I have a question. I know before you okay. ask, let me, let me ask you so that you come in. So my question is has to do with, um, there's a new element Kobana has introduced here, faith. You, you, you need to have faith in an entity which is outside of yourself, like let me describe it that way, which you, you have to believe that because he's with you, you can survive what you're going through. So it means that fear and faith is both um, fearing, like not knowing what's going to happen. So one one of it is giving you sleepless nights. One is giving you confidence that okay, I can get through the night. So um, from what from what we are talking about, we are coming to the the the, the main discussion. How because Kabbalah has given us how he deals with fear, and Kambian talked about. For instance, if someone is going to write an exam and the person is not prepared, because of that, he's afraid. Let's let's bring it out all that together. So, how do you deal with all of that? So, I want I want Combian to address that from the. No, scenario. let me let me add a little. So let let me let me say something about your question so that okay. it's very clear. 
the the thing is this i strongly believe that apart mm-hmm. from what convian shared mm-hmm. that the first part if you are prepared if you are prepared for a particular situation you don't have to fear you, you may not even need anyone to help you through that situation because you are prepared an example is 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 an examination that you are prepared mm-hmm. i mean if you have learned how to woo a girl have lyrics and all that and you know that a girl is passing by that one guy you are prepared but there will be some level of fear that you overcome but what i what i wrote in the book is that there are some that you you don't have it you are not prepared you don't have what it takes and it's beyond the how do i say it i'm trying to look for maybe if i'm arranging them in terms of realms or levels there are certain level that you need god to step in for you there are some level that it is your preparedness that is enough for you to just overcome the fear but i believe that there are certain degrees that you may not be fully prepared or you can never be prepared to face it and it is in that situation that you need the extinguisher of fear to walk you through Come here, over to you, sir. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Governor, for uh, for your input so far. I think uh, if you would permit me, I'll take a step back and look at uh, some kinds of fear because it appears to me that there are kinds of fear that can be dealt with and there are others that we, we, it can't be dealt with. Um, uh, let's take, for example, I mean, Broadly, I like to look at fear in two main ways, or maybe three. The first one has to do with um, there is actual threats out there mm-hmm. that I, knowing myself, feel inadequate to match up or face that threat. So I am afraid of something out there, real, not imagined. Then the second one has to do with something I think or imagine or perceive to be a threat, but which in actual fact may not be a threat. Mm-hmm. I may be afraid of that thing, thinking that what I think about the thing is actually the, the case, that it's a threat, while in actual fact, that thing is not a threat. Okay. A- an example may be somebody who is afraid of food. And he's going down a hill and he sees a mirage extending as, as though it's a large pool at the, at the base of, 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 the, of the, 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 the hill. He'll be scared. He'll be like, oh, I, I thought there was no water along this, this road. Why am I bumping into this? Now, it's a mirage. You're thinking about that thing. It doesn't make it what it is. So sometimes fear is a result of what we perceive about things. And our perception of them could be entirely wrong or even wrong. baseless mm-hmm. so we can have absolutely baseless fear and those ones are based on our faulty assumptions or thinking and the other one i want to call them instinctive now when we were kids uh depending on where you grow up uh i, I think it's it's culturally ingrained they they tend to use certain things to frighten kids like in Chi, you have something called Sasabunsam. I mean, imagine they use this to, to scare kids. Even if you grow up as an adult, the mere mention of that thing tickles you. Like it, 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 there's a way instinctively it's ingrained in you that in, anytime it is mentioned, it's supposed to evoke fear in you. So even if you have grown past that age, yet that thing somehow, because it's instinctive, can can more like trigger fear. Sometimes it may not last, but there's a way it, it triggers fear. And another thing has to do with uh, you see people are scared of cockroach. Uh, what the hell is a cockroach to be scared of? Uh, worm. Somebody's uh, somebody's have uh, scared of millipede. Come on, these are things. Well, instinctively, he's he's he has some repulsion towards it. So anywhere it sees it, where that. The cockroach can actually bite his head off or not. No, that is not what he's thinking. He just, he fears cockroaches. So he's, he has to run away. So there is also those kinds of fear. So broadly, let's put them under three categories. Instinctive, uh, real threats that you can't face, and then imagined ones. You, you realize that um, 
let's begin with the instinctive. Well, psychology now has been able to help us to reprogram our, our conscious mind so that it also affects our unconscious mind. So if somebody is able to, uh, an expert is able to assist you to unwind whatever fear you have come to ingrain in you about cockroaches and millipedes, the person will be able to erase the, the, the irrational fear, instinctive fear you have about cockroaches and, and millipedes. So that one, I think it's expert can help us. Uh, now let's look at um, imagined fear, well, the, the ones based on faulty assumptions and conceptions. Uh, those ones, usually, um, once your perception is corrected, or once you realize your perception is baseless, the fear itself disappears. disappears. So it's it, it's the reworking of your perception that deflates the fear. So it's almost like uh, you thought this thing was coming to swallow it. All of a sudden, you realize this is nothing at all. You know that sigh of relief. <laughs> You're like, oh, I thought this thing was coming to swallow. Me. That's it. It deflates instantly. So once your perception perceptions are reworked, your imaginations are corrected, the fear disappears. Now the problem has to do with the real one. Now, different kinds of real threats, we simply can't, it's absolutely impossible. No matter how trained you are, it's impossible not to be scared when you see a mountain lion. It's, it's impossible. Lion is not some imagined animal. It's sitting there, you know, you're hiking, and you see a mountain tiger or lion approaching you possibly trying to bait you into some corner where he can pounce on you. No matter how trained you are, even if you are the modern day Samson, you still will have, you still will experience some fear. So those physical, real world threats, what determines the extent to which we can deal with it has to do with the magnitude or the intensity of the threat itself. Facing a lion is no joke. Imagine the, uh, the uh, articles, uh, what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. All of a sudden, should I put this? Just one sec, my daughter is disturbed. Yeah. Yes, yes, please. Okay, so just taking off from where I left, uh, we can see that um, instinctive fear can be reworked when some experts help us to uh, unwind the source of the fear, the, 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 inst the instinct which I mean, invokes the fear or triggers the fear anytime uh, the object we associate with the fear comes up. Uh, and it's also the case with um, imagined fear. Once our imaginations are corrected, our perceptions, uh, I mean, verified, the fear disappears. It vanishes because there was actually no fear in the first place. Uh, strangely, uh, I forgot to add this point. It looks like most of us live even more with imagined fear than real fear. <laughs> it's true. Most people are rather terrified by a lot of things they merely imagine. In fact, if they were to take just a few minutes to verify whatever they are afraid of, the, the fear itself would have disappeared. But they allow the they will allow that to inform or even become so much a part of them that it, it's literally impossible to 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 walk out of that fear. So we just just re-examine your beliefs and your perceptions and your imaginations and you deal away with most of the fear. Now, I came up to the real fear, world, the real, the, the real threat in the world that wow. uh, is almost like insurmountable. You bump up against a, a mountain lion while hiking. No, you know this lion is not my friend. No, this lion is not here to say hi. Did you enjoy the hiking? <laughs> no, it's hungry and it's looking for a meal. 
And from the way the lion looks at you, it's almost like, yeah, you're boiled and served. He's looking for the best place to sit and enjoy you. You simply cannot. It's, it's, it's ingrained in us to, to have some reasonable fear about that. It may not be a lion, but it may be something. For example, no matter how mentally focused and prepared you are, uh, you just finished uh, maybe uh, Harvard Medical School or John Hopkins, and you are admitted to be a part of the president's medical team. Now, you see, it's not as though you are ill-prepared or ill-equipped or you don't have the expertise. No. You have trained from one of the best medical schools in the world. John Hopkins, Harvard, dope. But the mere fact of you being a member of a team which takes care of the health of the most powerful human being on earth, that alone, it, it, you're like, it, it brings some kind of fear. It, it may not be so much fear, but you are, it, it makes you a little more cautious, a little more not nervous. So sometimes it's, it's not just like something that is going to eat you up or some, uh, some monster staring you in the face. It's a real life situation that you know, yes, I'm prepared. I have the abilities to face this thing, but still, it's just the bad part of it. It's human. It's it's natural. Imagine you 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 are going to meet, say, uh, how do you call it, sir? The president of Ghana. I mean, the deep respect you have for that seat, even if it is occupied by somebody who is messing up. Um, uh, it, it makes you feel like, okay, who is this? How's the meeting going to be like? I remember my first time meeting before. I was, I was fine. I was not shaking. I was not packed. But there was a boundary that I'm like, no, this man is not ordinary. Yeah. He's, he's not ordinary. So those things are, are there. But usually uh, they are not as threatening as in the case of the lion. Or maybe you just got employed to go and work as one of the the guys to uh, the security, cyber security guys for uh, Google. And you know how many intelligent hackers are out there who are willing mm -hmm. to, they are ready on standby working to out which whatever wall you, security wall you, you mount, they will break it, breach it, just to show you that we know what you are doing more than you. That alone, the challenge, the volume of what you have to do that alone itself poses some kind of threat, which may make you a little bit up. So preparedness can take away greater chunk of fear, but there's still a human part of us which makes us fear no matter how extremely prepared we are for a given situation. It's just normal. I mean, uh, let me give you something that relates to my life so that it doesn't look like we are just counting some the hypotheticals. There's this uh, philosopher here called Robert Audi. He's one of the few uh, remaining icons in philosophy. If it comes to uh, rationalism, epistemology, and all those ethics, he's one of the finest in the world, not just in America. My first time, uh, I had to take a seminar on moral rationalism. I was like, how's the experience going to be like? Meeting one of the very best philosophers in the world. And you see, his towering figure alone, if you don't think I will overshadow you. I, I remember there was a day we spent our opportunities talking about what a semicolon was doing in a given sentence by what's what? One of the ancient, I mean, English philosophers. And he was asking whether if he were, uh, the person had replaced it with a colon or a comma, whether it would have uh, influenced the structure of the sentence. Uh -huh. And therefore, <laughs> my God, Jesus Christ, oh dear. So, <laughs> this is not like some fear that will cripple you, but you know, like sometimes it's out of respect, you know, it's out of the enormous respect you have for someone it can result in some form of fear. 
usually a mild one. So the nature, the intensity of the fear you face and your preparedness can determine the extent to which you deal with that fear. So basically, roughly, uh, that's 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 my initial uh, answer to how we can deal with fear based on the kinds of fear I can quickly wrap my mind around. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. So um, I think that we have, we have we've, we've gone around the, the topic now. So now we've, we've got an understanding that some of the fear is just about, uh, it goes back to some are illusion then because some of them are not real fear. It's based yeah. on indoctrination, what we've been told, what we've learned in our environment, where we stay, where we grew up. So how do we even begin to unpack unpack all these like because let's say um someone may, may be afraid of blacks for instance let's say a chinese or a black man may be afraid of white people just because of the history that he's been told that white people who are afraid of blacks just because of history that have been told them which may or may not be true but that drives their fear of the black man so in in let, focusing on what we are talking about right now, how do we begin to question our fear? Like begin to examine our fear to see why am I even afraid of marriage, for instance? Why 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 am I afraid of women? Or why am I afraid of starting a business? Or why am I afraid of going back to school to get um, a master's and PhD? Why am I afraid of like the things that we fear? Where do we begin to ask ourselves like? What is driving this fear? Is it um, an illusion? Is it true? What are the bases for this? I don't know if, if I'm coming across clear. Yeah, yeah, you are. You are. Yeah, yeah you are. Let me say yeah. a few things before I'll, I'll let Kamna take over. I'm sure he may have better experience than myself. Um, let me start with myself. I, I mean, it, I don't intend to present myself as some uh, serious guy who has some serious life. No, no. And there's some, some small trick that I use that sometimes it helps me that I want to, I want to put up this. Um, in life, I think I am more critical about myself more than even I am about any other thing. I, I, sometimes I find it very difficult to forgive myself when I make some flimsy, silly mistakes. I am terribly critical about myself. It helps in some sense, well, then you know, in some other sense, but this is how we relate with fear. If you can do some introspection and question yourself about certain things, some of your assumptions and beliefs, some of the things that inform how you act, how you relate with people, if you can be dead honest with yourself, like very critical with yourself, there's a way you begin to face some of these thinking some of this stuff out. You realize that, oh no, it's basically no reason why I should, have, I should have done. So you can, through introspection, rework how you your mind perceives certain things so that if there's an element of fear in, in, in that, you, you inevitably deal away with those elements. So one way we can start is to, to, to uh, be very critical with ourselves to do some introspection. But I, it just dawned on me that even the extent to which you can be honest with yourself and not terrified is, is dependent on the larger environment within which you find yourself. Now, people think the African man is needlessly religious. Uh, but there's a reasonable sense in which it makes sense for the African man or somebody who's living in Africa to be more religious than who is living elsewhere. I'm just giving a funny and practical situation. Look, I don't remember the last time I saw an Aspen. When I lived in the UK, now in the US, I don't remember the last time I saw an Aspen. I don't know. You, like, buses run. It's like, if you are late, it's almost as if, yeah, you wanted to be late. That's why you're late. So, like, the, the extent to which the system, the failure of the system affects you, it's so terribly minimal as to not be of worry to you. So I won't get up 
number one, praying about accidents. That, oh, dear Lord, help me that once I go out, I may not be knocked down by. No, no, no. I, I don't remember the last time I said any such prayer. I can take a bus all the way from Sheffield down to London, about three hours on the way. M1 is a solid highway. I'm fine. No, it won't happen. Yes, human errors are possible. Even we are working with a machine, it can fail. But human beings, the system has managed to reduce the risk to the extent that you literally have no reason to worry about it. If it is about health, no. The hospitals are, I mean, my the, the, the first time my, my wife arrived here, she was like, it looks like in this place, uh, people respect or value animals even more than we value human beings in our place. We visited our director of graduate studies. Uh, he invited us for dinner and we went to his house. And he showed us a, a little chat, but he was driving and saw the poor animal trying to cross the road. And he sensed that if he left that thing there, some car unknown, not knowing that it was possible, crash. He went down, picked that poor animal, created a suitable environment for it in his house, feeding it on, he has done research about the food they like and feeding those. Now, nah, so you see, this is just an ordinary turtle where somewhere else it could be crushed or somebody will use it for potato soup. No, somebody, <laughs> <laughs> somebody. Oh, come on, is, my life. Giving my it life that is much bigger. attention. Ah. Oh, you, know, you, know, you, know. <laughs> you see, you, you, you pray, you, you pray for light when you are living in UK or US. Now, uh, Corona, you see what I was saying. Now, exactly. He's still worried about when his light will come back and when his uh, laptop battery will run out. <laughs> I, I remember the last time light blinked. I don't remember. Uh, I don't know. The only it. time I, I think the only time I got noticed mm -hmm. from. Was it the water or something? So that was even far back in the UK. Was that they were coming to do some regular uh, checks and repairs? So they were giving me notice so that I will grant them access when it's time for them to come. That was just it. And when it's time and you are not even there, just make sure they can access your apartment and look at it and go there. That's all. So you see, things I wouldn't pray that when I have a small company, power won't go off for my production to stop. But you will have that worry. So yeah. the environment itself has a way of inducing fear in you or helping you to re-examine your life in a way that takes away a chunk of the fear. I don't, I don't need to be worried about what hot goes when I'm driving. I don't have to be worried about whether my insurance will be quick to pay my claims when I have a problem. I, those things are not my worries. There are certain diseases that are literally absent in my corner of the world. So I don't wake up pray, praying that, oh, dear Lord, Valeria, the Empire, Mio, the Empire. No, no, I, that is not my word. Yay. That, you see? <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's just too funny to be a coincidence. I, I don't know. It's just, it's just too funny to be a coincidence. It, the environment in itself, the environment itself. So, Oh, Imagine the, two, the three of us. You you started a business in Ghana. I have started one. How much support will I get to grow my business? How much support will yes. you get to grow your business? How open is your environment to even the idea you are introducing through your uh -huh. business? How much is my environment? Open? So you see, we are two different sets of people having different sets of challenges based on the environment in which we are. So. I live in constant fear of even the people around me in Ghana. You could be a German for I say, when you scan an the episode, who this kind of pay? They are coming to either steal the money or lazy around and take pay for no work done, or they they will come with all manner of sufficient negative attitudes to pull out your job. So these are the things that I do not to deliver there, but I, I meant to, to show that sometimes where you live can determine the extent of your introspection. I mean, in Ghana, you can do introspection and, and be honest with yourself, but how far can your honesty go? I mean, you're honest, yeah. honest. Yeah, how far can your honesty go? You still live with this fear constantly every day that 
I may have a meet. Imagine, uh, uh, Rudolph, you had a, an appointment with uh, maybe Harvard Medical School. You wanted to do some follow-up control. All of a sudden, your power goes off. Your laptop battery is dead. How embarrassing could that be? And you are not the only person they are considering. By the time your power comes on, it comes on again. Uh, maybe somebody has impressed them enough to take away the, the few opportunities they have. See? So this basic stuff can influence how fear gets its way into your unconscious. So you live in constant fear without even knowing that I'm living in constant fear. So those are those are some of the those are some. So where you live, yeah. how honest you can be with yourself, uh, all those things they determine how much you face your fear and and work your way out. Of it. Yeah. Governor. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I think Prof has said, my, the first thing I was going to say is to try to identify the fear that you are actually feeling. And that's what Paul's meant by have an introspection of who, like the fear that you feel, because from earlier on, from, from Prof's assessment, if you know the kind of fear, people do not identify the kind of fear, they just go on to act on it. Like you said, if there is a white person who is afraid of blacks, they don't, what they do, is to go to the extreme and act on the fear to start defending, not even defending, be on the offensive. So when you when you actually um when you actually find the reason behind what they do, you realize that it's it's because of fear. It's simply because of fear why a black guy will be jogging on the street and a white man will pick a gun and shoot him. For what reason? Because of fear. And when they don't identify the fear and and try to ascertain the the authenticity of that particular fear, whether it's even real, whether it is it is possible of causing you harm, then they go on to act on it. It's the same thing you are afraid of. Most people see there's a certain kind of fear, and uh, maybe it will fall in. I was trying to write what uh, Prof was putting down. Maybe you can just follow instinctive fear. You're just scared that when you ask somebody for probably a favor, the person will not yep. grant it. Meanwhile, you need that particular favor. And so you don't ask and you are there. But I just fear that this particular cause, let's say just today, I was talking to a colleague of mine, I saw uh, a photography competition and I sent the link to her and I told her to apply. So oh, no, e, I just checked the previous readers and they are kind of pictures they took. I don't think that I qualify. Uh, and I, do you know what the judges are looking yeah, this is what the judges are actually himself. looking at. Yeah, he himself has disqualified himself. Do you he get it? He's waiting for the other people to disqualify him to confirm that, yes, he was not even qualified in the first place. Why? Who? Do you get it? So I have to, I have to just tell you that, sincerely, what do you have to lose? Practically nothing. They are not asking for any submission fees. They are not asking you to, to send them pictures that you shot at a particular, within a particular, at a particular time or a certain site. They are just asking for photos. Yeah. And I've seen her works. So I told her just you I told her you just apply. If you if you can't apply, you send me your details, I'll apply or be here, but you, you just apply. So you see if you identify the fear, it will help you know how to deal with it. So that's the first thing. I think you need to identify it. And in identifying it, you need to understand the kind of fear that they are. You need to understand whether this is insistent, this one is um imagined fear. Or this one is just a physical fear, something that you can easily, with enough information and understanding, it will no longer be fear. The other thing is that once you identify what it is, it is important to seek help. But most people don't do that. Most people don't even talk up. No. This is taking me back, but I think that we live in a community or we're brought up in an environment where we are not taught how to speak out, to communicate how we are feeling or what you are going through. And so you realize that fear may be the reason somebody is not pursuing a certain venture or undertaking a certain course or anything of that sort, but they don't say it. They just make an excuse, oh, I don't have enough money. Oh, I don't think it suits me or something of that sort. But when you probe further, you realize that they are simply we scared. Cut short, but it looks like Rudolph will have to arrange another meeting for us to talk about <laughs> uh, 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 even our culture and how it, it, it influences who yeah. we are as persons and how that exactly is, uh, it, it, it affects what we become later on it's i think we need a conversation around that thing because just as you we mentioned need, we need. even in right in the house your dad is the first person to shut you up 
Why are you talking when I am talking? Why should I not talk because you are talking? <laughs> <laughs> Any child who is a little bit upset <laughs> or a girl, he is proud. Proud <laughs> day you, 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 like, they, so our system looks for opportunities to punish those who can stand out and assert yeah. themselves as proud people who need punishment. Like, we just want to shut you down. Shut you exactly. up. Exactly. Political communication. Yes, it's a million people. The one who has argued against and made somebody's point senseless. Exactly. That is the one who has argued. Meanwhile, an adult will stand and say, and, and use a woman's private part to insult her on national TV. We are okay with that adult. We say he's speaking the truth. But my Kraki Tonko can the same thing. So I think uh, we need a whole episode to talk about <laughs> is uh, this you do, people, what do. you call your rich culture. So I rich culture and it's, it's absolute <laughs> nonsense. It's, it's I absolute think that the it's culture, I mean, we have to segregate it. We have to segregate it and look for Look for the portions that are sick and try to heal yeah. it. Try to find medication for it. If you were to ask me, I'll tell you everything needs to go. <laughs> everything needs to go. Everything. Needs to go. And our forefathers won't be happy with you. Yeah, we will. We'll, is it? Our forefathers won't be happy with you. Our forefathers. They can do whatever they want. We are not here to, to please them. I'm sure you saw my tradition of, uh, of tradition, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's not somebody said. <laughs> Somebody tradition, mentioned that the definition of tradition is peer pressure from dead people. From, from dead, dead people. people. <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> peer pressure from dead people. Yeah. Our forefathers, our forefathers. We don't even know who the forefathers are. <laughs> <laughs> they were they thought of, I mean, most of the things they proposed and did were based on pure ignorance and and, and nonsense. So why should we keep leaving them because they came down from our forefathers? Anyone know as I said? They came down for our forefather. <laughs> ah, come on. My forefather was, was didn't know any, any of the stuff I know today. So why should I restrain myself by uh, forefather, forefather? Don't mind, don't mind. Anyway, I, 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 I just tell you this one. Yeah, so I come think we... With, with, uh, with, uh, yeah, come we on. We are facilitating that time. Hey, I think I have uh, another... We have, another we, have about, we have about 10 minutes more to go, so... Oh, okay, so my point is that you need to identify it. And when you identify it, it is important to even look at the evidence, look at what you have. Because most often, we underestimate our ability to overcome these fears. Sometimes you are fully equipped to overcome it, but because you don't know, or because it could be that past experiences, that's what past experiences put you in a certain position that it totally um, probably puts an embargo on your strength, the ability to actually deal with a particular fear. So. Just as I mean, you find somebody, there have been moments where I'm sitting by a paper and I've learned, I know, I know it, but somehow fear has gripped me that you're going to fail this paper. But I'm fully equipped, I, I've learned, I know. So, in those moments, how do I do that particular fear? So, I think it's important to identify it, look at what you have, and talk about it. Somehow, even as well, I'm trying to bring in another topic that Komiya will actually say that we need to talk about it. We really need to talk about how, as men, we are even groomed or we are taught to live in society that even seeking for help makes you feel that you are not man enough or reduces you to yeah, a woman in quotes. Cry yourself, cry yourself. They say you are not supposed to cry. Amen. You are afraid to cry. If you get it. And uh, so sometimes if you... Let's say there is a typical man who is afraid of cockroaches. I mean, you think that to be the fear of cockroaches is something that lies with women. women. And so if you're a man and you are, you are the, it will be difficult for you to talk about it. And so again, that culture of silence or us taught to swallow everything, not share it, don't look, don't look weak. If you say it, you're going to look weak. That is also something that is there we need to talk about. So identify it, look at the evidence, Talk about it, like talk about what you are going through. Share with somebody and seek help from the appropriate quarters. I mean, people, there are people that because of fear, you it will amaze you what they have, um, opportunities they have missed because of fear. I mean, they are, you can even talk about job opportunities. When they see the requirements and they realize that 15 years experience, 
What, 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 what is okay? This one I don't Look qualify. Mind. Why not? I will not try. You know, Kamana <laughs> said, take her from the appropriate courses. And uh, I was going to talk about the issue of even um, fear and mental health. Well, like, where is appropriate courses? <laughs> A small point. Uh, sometimes, well, actually, two. The first one is if you learn to do what you fear, fear goes away. That thing is not, it's not a joke. It's not a just um, a, yeah. a joke. It's true. People who are afraid of guns, take them to places where they can learn target shooting. With time, the, the fear of guns goes away. That's it's just it. It's true. Let I mean, when people are able to practice some of the things they are afraid of, again, afraid it comes of. into the environment. Where in Ghana can someone who has genuine fear for guns go to learn to shoot? Now, Christ, you can open the gap for talking to you. You can't go to the gap for talking to you. Do you want to get Appropriate quarters. <laughs> so, and, and, and the other thing is, I think. Great things come from people who want to think alike, at least for a long time. For example, this thing we have started, for all you know, it will grow into something people who think like us will join us and we will have regular conversation and we'll begin to shape how people understand things based on the few points, useful points that we can offer. Not as though we are the most intelligent people, but at least the, some specks of wisdom and insight will fall off our conversation and people will begin to pick up and it will form how they think. So finding the right kind of people and aligning yourselves with them can also get, giving you to, like, to take away some fears. Let me give you a practical example. A lot of people uh, approach me and they want to study outside of that. And everything about what they ask is framed in fear. They already know that they don't even qualify to apply to this university. Or if they apply, they will not be admitted. Or the, if they are admitted, they will not be given funding. Or if they are not give, they are given funding, it won't be full funding. Even if they are given full funding, they, they won't be able to pay for visa processes. Even if they do visa processes, uh -huh. they won't be able to buy a ticket. It, from one fear to another, consistently all the way up. But after explaining things in simplest terms to them, it begins to like, they're like oh, but it, so it's simple like that, right? Well, it depends on how you see. It. So finding the right people, like you said, right quarters, getting the right kind of help, as I said, can be very useful. But the question is, who are the right people? Yeah. Who are the right people? And sometimes, let me let me be, be, say it. Uh, some people are not aware, but how you approach some people can be terrible. I remember there's this young lady, uh, I wouldn't, well, she's, she just completed her master's in uh, Nottingham University in the UK. She didn't know me. She just approached me on Facebook and said, hi, I saw you on uh, uh, Intake Ghana website and they said they handled your application. You, are, you have successfully studied in the UK. I want to go to, to UK, so I just wanted to know if you could point me in the right direction just an innocent lady looking for help we had a wonderful chat i gave her the directions i could she's she's done with her masters in the uk simple i didn't pay her fees i didn't seek for funding for her i just pointed her in the right direction that's all so but there are others who come and say Tell her, i want scholarship I, i'm not sharing scholarship now i mean are you see me here <laughs> me myself, I'm a scholar. <laughs> when you are approaching somebody, at least you know, be nice a little bit. I mean, be diplomatic. Tell the person, oh, I, I, I really would want to study outside, but I have no idea where to start from. Uh, would you be of help? Can I, can I take a bit of your time to? That is fine. But some people just come and make it look like, okay, you got wherever you got the funding from, go and get it. From it doesn't work like that. So. Even though we, we have to find the right people to align with, we also have to know how to approach it. I can't just get up, even with my familiarity with uh, Rudolph, I just say, Tare, I want this. No, yeah, yeah, we don't do that. At least be, be nice, small. Maybe. 
So the, all these things matter. Don't yeah. don't kill yourself. Find the right people and align with. Identify your fears, come as said, and 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 find a way to deal with it. It's it's just simple. I think there's a phrase I picked from Joyce Mayer in in a lot of her her books and then in her podcasts and then her videos that do it afraid. Yeah. Uh, do it do it afraid. And yeah. has stayed with me. Do it afraid. Even in the midst of the fear, do it. Governor, thank you. You just drew my attention <laughs> to something. I realized that our conversation has framed fear as a negative thing. No, it's not entirely negative. It's I was a going, I was going to <laughs> It's a powerful positive weapon. Fear can make you prepare more than you would ordinarily have prepared. Of course, if if you're afraid of if you're afraid of dying of diabetes, which helps you to start taking care of yourself, that is good. Right? Yeah. It's not and then entire so there's some level of fear that should be respected. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it keeps you out of very danger. Yeah. You have to avoid what what's ahead and also unnecessary pain there are some pains we suffer because we we are we act fearless when we are supposed to be careful yeah 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 in my case my great I five i have to tell you my rule number one thou shall not find himself on the wrong side of the law and when i was leaving ghana that was the first thing i told myself i never want to be on the wrong side of the law whether in the uk or in america no 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 Whatever will get me on the wrong side of the door, I am far away from it. I avoid it like, like, even more than. Uh, <laughs> so, my fear of getting on the wrong side of the law puts me in the safe side. I mean, it's valid. Him. It's valid. <laughs> it, exactly. Fear can be a very powerful weapon. It's, it's, yeah. it's not as if it's always negative. So, I, I, I'm glad I could not brought that point up. Right, so, right so I mentioned that before we go away. No, I think of making fear look like it's all negative. <laughs> yeah. We have we have unanimously agreed that we have to do this again and and talk about our our environment, our upbringing, our forefathers. <laughs> it looks we, like we have a lot to talk about. We have yeah. to talk about. So we have to. We, we have, have to. a lot. We have a lot to talk about. And I'm um, I'm actually working on seeing if Sunday evenings like this could just be dedicated to having these conversations. And like he said, it could spark some fire. You know, you never know who will come near the heat. Yeah. But I was just, I just remember this. Crazy guys, I have some crazy guys who I could, I could introduce into the whole thing to, to spice the conversation. Please. Oh, I would love Please it. Please bring them. It will be it. fun. It will be fun. Yes, yes, yes. We should do this. We should actually do this. Um, I'm yeah. reading a piece from um, Chino Achebe since Fall Apart, just to close it up. Ah, my favorite. My favorite <laughs> of all time. Oh, sorry. Uh, if he is your favorite, I'm here to, to bust your bubble. My favorite is <laughs> Ngugi Watiango. The Kenyan. I like him too. I really yeah. like him. <laughs> he, is, he is solid. Atebe says that perhaps uh, down in his heart, Okonko was not Okonko. a true <laughs> But his whole life was dominated by fear. The fear. fear of failure and of weakness. It was deeper and more intimate than the fear of evil and capricious gods and of magic. The fear of the forest and the fear of the forces of nature. Malevolence, red in tooth and claw. Okonko's fear was greater than this. It was not a stainer, but lay deep within himself. This is a man who was like the strongest and the most feared in the community, but he carried this fear that no one knew about and so everything he was doing externally was just because of what was boiling inside of him he was doing gra gra on the outside too <laughs> so aggression like is an indication of the fear from within yes oh yeah, uh, yeah right, sure. uh, right that was some deep level psychology aggression <laughs> yeah. is an indication of some deep-seated fear that's true that's true that's true yeah no thank wonder for that community. Thank you. This is this is lovely. Uh, I think we. Uh, I, I wish we are doing it for the next one hour, but just to keep. <laughs> yeah, keep we keep gotta go. Anyway, when we'll you stop the recording, I may just say something quickly. When you stop the recording, I will say something. All right. So I think <laughs> I would. I would have to bring us back on so we talk about how we want to do this after after here. So for now, okay. And this, thank you all very much for making this a success. We want to see this. Thank you too. 
it's been fun and i hope that our those who watch today tomorrow later whenever we share it with them are going to benefit from it as well peace thank you